Father, we thank you for this day, and as we take time now to come to your word and to learn from you, we pray that you will teach us, that you will bring conviction and comfort and challenge and whatever is needed. Your word is sufficient according to what you tell us for every need to equip us for life and for good works, and we pray that you will reach into our hearts, help us to see ourselves. Thank you for the way we've already been able to minister to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs as you remind us in Colossians. And uh, Lord, we have truly been lifted up, encouraged as we see others whose commitment to you is strong, urging us, Father, I'm encouraged to go on, to continue to be faithful by what I see in the lives of others. So we pray that you'll continue that ministry in us. Thank you for Tim being able to be here today as we've been praying for him and the treatments that he's undergoing now. Pray that you'll continue to be with him and Jen as they um, try and figure out family responsibilities at the time, same time that he's in Phoenix most of the time. And, uh, but we're, we're really grateful to see him, see him doing well at this point. And so we pray that you'll continue to bring health. And Lord, there are many others who are facing significant challenges health-wise, um, financially, But Lord, more than anything, spiritually and emotionally, how we need you. And I know that there is throughout our congregation need for healing and place after place after place. Grudges being held. Not understanding certain things that are going on in life. Discouragement, despair, doubt. I pray that you will reach down this morning by your spirit and remove every single one of those. That you will be powerful, that you will be victorious. We pray this. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. amen. You may be seated. Please turn with me to Luke 16 as we continue in this series, parable about me. Luke 16, I'm going to read beginning in verse 19. Luke 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And the Lord bless this reading of his word. Grandmother took her three-year-old grandson to the church for the first time. His parents didn't, were not faithful in that regard. They didn't take him, and the grandmother had the opportunity, and she took him, and the boy looked around. He watched the service for a while, and then he finally looked at his grandmother, and he said, Grandma, what time does Jesus get here? Figured he hadn't seen Jesus yet. Well, that's a really good question, is it not? It's one which every one of us must answer for our own lives. And since Jesus does not impose himself on anyone against their will, the answer to the question, when does Jesus get here, is really simple. It's whenever we invite him to take his rightful place as our Lord and as our master. When we find a new identity in Christ, different than the identity we were born with, failing that... The Bible is very clear about the consequences. We will one day enter eternity with the old identity that we never changed, the identity of self, and disaster, according to the Bible, awaits those who follow that path into eternity. It's a big, big question. 
Now, no place in Scripture, I suppose, addresses hell more vividly than this parable of our Lord. It is a parable about identity, identity. It's a parable about not living for the self that we are born with the natural tendency to do, but about finding a new identity in Christ, about finding a new life in Christ, and about the importance of doing that. It's a, it contrasts these two men who have this great reversal in eternity. It's not about poor and rich, although Jesus uses that contrast to make the contrast as vivid as possible, but it's a contrast really between self and in Christ. And the rich man chooses to keep with the identity of self that he was born with. His total concentration is on piling things up, getting things, making wealth, having position in this life, and he's very successful at that. Meanwhile, Lazarus is there. Lazarus, whose name means the one whom God has helped, and it certainly didn't look like it in this life. But his identity was in God. He believed what the song said today. God is good all the time, even if you're lying at the doorstep of someone else to get the crumbs off their table. Better days are coming. And so they were for this man. The parable teaches that the identity we choose in this life is the identity that we will have Forever. It's a long time. And you know, you would look at this and it would appear that the rich man has the edge here, right? He has everything. Lazarus has nothing. But in the end, God looks, what? Not an outward appearance, but on the heart. And the chosen identity of these two took the rich man to hell and it took Lazarus to heaven. A complete reversal of fortune based on who they were. One trusted self, one trusted Christ. So our outline for this passage, first point was the eternal me is determined in this life. Looked at that a couple weeks ago. The, this is me informed, but me having the ability still in this life to make a decision about who I will be, whether it will just be me or whether it will be in Christ. The second point, death reveals but does not change me. In other words, death is going to unveil the choices that I made in this life. And there are three points under that that we wanted to look at. Number one, there will be surprises, which we looked at last week. And if you, did, if you weren't here last week, please go online, listen to that sermon or download it or something. But th this passage is loaded with the surprises that there will be in eternity for those who have not prepared. Then the second point, there will be suffering. And finally, there will be splendor. So today we have reached the suffering part. These are hard sermons to preach, beloved. I would much rather be back in Luke 15. But I think Luke put those two passages side by side because he wants to draw the contrast between a God who is seeking us in Luke 15 in those three wonderful parables and what happens when we neglect and when we reject the God who is seeking us. He's put them side by side. So while we don't like to talk about hell, and it's difficult to think about hell, it is for me as I'm sure it is for you. It's here. And God's put it here for a reason. God tells us in Ezekiel 33, verse 8, he says, listen, if I issue a warning to somebody and you fail to tell them, he said, his blood I will require at your hand. That's why Jesus was faithful to issue this warning and why we must speak to it as well. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Failing to come to repentance, we will perish. For those who reject his offer of forgiveness, there is no alternative. The eternal, listen, if you don't get this yet, the eternal destiny of believers and unbelievers is drastically different. And there's no middle ground. There may be what seems to be middle ground in this life, but not in the life to come. And Jesus knew what awaits after death, and that's why he issues this parable. So let's look today at the second point here. There will be suffering. The rich man represents the destiny of unbelievers. And Jesus describes his experience this way in verse 23. He says, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. So Jesus is telling us some things about hell here. He's telling us that hell is real. 
He's telling us that hell is a place of torment. He's telling us that hell is eternal. And he's telling us that hell is the destination of everyone who refuses to be identified with Christ and to take their identity in him. It's interesting, I think, that while this man asks for a lot of things in this passage of Scripture, as we will see, the one thing he never asks for, he never asks out. He never says, please get me out of here. Wouldn't that, you think that would be the first thing that would come to his mind, get me out of here? But he asked for all kinds of little things, and we'll see why in just a little bit. But the point is, he would not accept the lordship of God in this life, and he was not interested in the lordship of God in the life to come. He never asks out. But as a result, he's going to have a godless existence. So what is a godless existence like? Six things that we'll see. We'll take the first two today. We'll take four more next week. Six things that this passage points out. Number one, a godless existence. There will be torment without termination. There will be torment without termination. Rich man, it's the only identification we have of him, is in torment. Verse 24, he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his tongue in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Now we might ask, first question, can people really talk between heaven and hell? Is that really something that goes on? And the answer to that question is no. This is a parable. Jesus is telling a story to make a point, but, the, but let's, let's not get hung up on the detail. Let's get the point. What's the point? The point is, that hell is a place of suffering. That to be without God is to suffer. And to be out without God eternally is to suffer eternally. It's interesting here that the rich man addresses his request to Father Abraham. Did you notice that? Why does he do that? Well, he's pulling on his Jewish heritage. He's, he's thinking, I'm a Jewish person. I was born to the chosen people. Surely that'll be enough to get me in. I'll just ask Father Abraham. The Jews even taught. The father of Abraham sat at the gates of hell and would not allow anyone to go there. Not, not that it was a Jewish person. So he's calling on his Jewish person, but he's got the wrong person, doesn't he? Jesus is the Savior, not Abraham. So he's a little mixed up on that issue. But his problem goes much, much deeper than this. Notice that he, what does he ask for? He asks for mercy. Have mercy. Have mercy. Listen, is God a God of mercy, beloved? Is, is, is God a God of mercy? I mean, throughout the Bible, what does it tell us over and over again? God is a God of mercy. Exodus 34, 6, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Listen, here's how, mercifully, here's how merciful God is. Every time that we see somebody or we ourselves do something wrong in this life and, we're, and we don't die right now, God is being merciful. We have violated the character of God with every single wrong thing, word, deed that we do. The penalty, as God said in the very beginning, is death. And when we don't die, God is being merciful. The mercy of God is visible to us all the time. His patience is long-suffering. Yes, God is merciful. But in all his life, this rich man had never asked for mercy. He never sought it out. He never took time to reflect on the fact of God's holiness, the absolutely perfection of God's holiness and the limitations of his own human existence and therefore begged for mercy as we will see someone do in Luke 18. He never did that. And so now, when he lifts up his eyes in hell, being in torment and ask for mercy, it's too late. Mercy has an end. And the end comes at the point of death. His suffering is further seen in his request. He says, send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in anguish in this flame. Now, the obvious question is, and I'm sure it's the question in all of your minds, um, is, are the flames real? Is hell really a place of fire? 
Well, this I can tell you, the Bible consistently uses fire to depict the judgment of God. You can read through the Old Testament and over and over again, this is the phraseology that's used. And it reaches its pinnacle in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. If you want to look at it in Revelation 20, where God is speaking to the final judgment and what it's going to be like there. And listen to this language. Revelation 20, and beginning in verse 13. Revelation 20, verse 13. God says, And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then... Death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Fire is the consistent way that the Bible describes hell and God's judgment. So is it figurative or is it real? Well, I can't answer that question with final authority. I will say this. If you look at verse 22, back in Luke chapter 16, you will find that the rich man died, and then he was buried. He was buried. Now, what part of him was buried? Well, obviously, the body was buried, right? But something went on. Something went to hell. What was that? Well, that was, had to be his, his soul, right? The immaterial part of him. His soul is in hell. But we have no indication anywhere that physical fire could do damage to a spiritual part of us, to an immaterial part of us. That's just something that doesn't really make sense. And yet, all people who die that are unbelievers are going to, their body goes to the grave or the water or whatever happens, their soul goes to hell. So, is it possible that fire is just representative of the suffering of the soul? I think, I think that's possible. Can't say that for sure, but I think what Jesus is doing here is describing something that they're in torment. It's not their body that's in torment because their body is in the grave, their soul is in hell. We also know that hell was created who? For the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, verse 41. Those are spirit beings. The devil and his angels are not beings that have bodies, and yet hell was prepared for them. So would physical fire do damage to a spirit being? We have no indication that that would be true. So I think it's very likely that the fire is figurative. Can't tell you that for sure, but I think that's likely. But here's the point. If the fire is figurative, what does it mean? What does fire do? Well, number one, fire causes a lot of pain, right? That's why you don't routinely stick your hand in the fire and just leave it there to warm it up, right? A little warmth is good. Too much fire is really bad. It's painful. There's probably few things in life that are more painful than a burn. So fire brings pain. But fire also destroys. You throw something in the fire, what happens? It just shrivels up to nothing in a very short period of time, right? So fire is painful and fire destroys. So if fire is not literal, let's just assume that for the moment, if it's not literal, but it's God's chosen physical illustration of something that, is, that, that, that causes severe spiritual pain and spiritual disintegration, then we can only assume that it is a, an awful existence that occurs. I think we have the perspective that, that the fire isn't real, then hell isn't as bad as we thought. And the truth is, when we use something to illustrate something else, the reality is usually worse than the illustration. So whether the fire is real or whether it's not, it stands for endless spiritual torment and disintegration. Destruction. The shriveling of the soul, if you will. In Mark 9, verse 48, Jesus says, describes hell as this, he says it's a place where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Fire is not quenched. I, I get that. It means 
keeps going on forever, right? But what about their worm will not die? You know, most, I, frankly, I've never heard a preacher talk about that. <laughs> Had to go kind of look at this and research. What does that mean? The worm does not die. Well, Jesus is quoting there from a passage in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66. Let me just read it for you. Isaiah 66, verse 24, where God describes the fate of some of, of, some of Israel's enemies. Isaiah 66, verse 24, and he says, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worms shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. What Isaiah is describing there is that these bodies were, were subject to two forms of disintegration. The first was that they died. Okay, we get that. The second was that they were subject to the worms who would consume the dead. You walk around a bunch of dead bodies lying on the ground. Horrible image, right? But sooner or later, you're going to have the rodents and everybody else and the worms coming to eat them. Israel was very familiar with this kind of terminology. Why? Well, because where Isaiah is talking about this happening is a place just on the south edge of Jerusalem. It's a place that's known as the Valley of Henna, the Valley of Henna, or Gehenna, the Valley of Henna. That was a place, if you go back far enough in Israel's history, where when Israel left God and began to worship idols... And they got bad enough to worship. There was, there was a bunch of idols around them in the land of Canaan, but one set of idols was called Moloch. And if you've read the Old Testament, you've seen the word Moloch many times. What you may not have realized is that Moloch was a god who demanded of the people that they offer their children and, and burn them alive in fire. And in the valley of Hena, just south of Jerusalem, Israelites, not the pagan people, but Israelites would take their children after they got to worshiping this idol, they would build this big idol out of gold, who was known as Moloch. He was an ugly-looking figure, and they'd build fire underneath that, and then they'd bring their children and watch them as they screamed and hollered as they died in the fire, in the arms of that idol. Impossible to imagine. King Josiah put an end to that. He said, we're not going to have any more of that going on here. But the Valley of Gehenna, Valley of Hannah, Gehenna, became the sort of the, the garbage dump for Jerusalem. And by the time of Christ, that valley was constantly on fire with burning trash out there. And at times, dead bodies, when they didn't have anything else to do with them, they would sometimes bury them, but a lot of times they just threw them out on the fire in the, in the, in the, in, in the Valley of Henna. And sometimes, occasionally, even criminals. People that they didn't know what else to do with. And so they were familiar with the fire burning the bodies and with the worms coming to eat those bodies. This is the imagery. This is why Gehenna, this is why Gehenna was a name that was corresponded to hell by the New Testament times. So it was a place of extreme suffering and unimaginable horror if somebody would actually end up there. But of course in Gehenna, when the fires burned and the trash was thrown out there, and even if a body was thrown on it, pretty soon it was consumed and it was done and it was gone, right? But Jesus uses that and the New Testament uses that to describe the, the, the spiritual Gehenna where the suffering never ends, where the, where the eternal disintegration of the soul, the all-consuming anger, the total frustration, the torment goes on and on. That's the torment that awaits those who reject Christ. Seven times in the ministry of Jesus as recorded, he talks about hell as being a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Life without God, beloved, is an unending downward spiral into oblivion. But, it, but you never get there. It never ends. You know, we, we, we kind of we get a hint of this in life. Life has moments that all of our life can turn on, right? Small moments small decisions and suddenly you can't get them back. A couple of years ago, there was a 16-year-old girl named Aubrey, Aubrey, Aubrey Peters. She was hanging out with a, with a friend of hers in North Carolina and somehow they got a hold of a pistol that Aubrey's father owned. They were playing around with it, but they didn't really know anything about guns. 
And so at one point in time, the friend picked up the pistol and pulled the trigger with the pistol pointed directly at Aubrey's heart. Of course, the gun was loaded and the bullet went right through his heart, through her heart and killed her. Imagine being that young girl, living you know, your whole life with the thought, if, if only, if only I could have that one moment back. If I could only have that second back when I pulled that trigger, if only. And, but you can't. It's over. It's done. And this is, this, is, this is the torment of hell, beloved. It's the torment of an internal, if only. If only I had made the decision to accept Christ. If only I had allowed Jesus to become my identity instead of living my whole life about myself. If only. You know, whether the fire is literal or not, the thought of an eternal if only will be real enough, will it not? So hell is a place of torment without termination. That's what the Bible teaches, beloved. It doesn't give me pleasure to teach this, but that's what the Bible tells us. That's what Jesus is telling us. Second thing, there will be darkness without dawn. There will be darkness without dawn. Now hang with me here for a second, because if you're looking through and reading through that parable, you're probably saying, well, where's the darkness? I don't see any darkness here. But beloved, believe me, in hell, it is lights out. It's lights out. Listen to some passages of Scripture. Just note these, and you can look at them later if you'd like. But 2 Peter 2, verse 4. Peter says, and keep in mind, he was taught by Jesus. And his words were written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment... He says in 2 Peter 2, verse 17, speaking of unbelievers, he says, for them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. In Jude chapter, uh, Jude, Jude's only one chapter, but in Jude verse 6 and verse 13, Jude speaks of unbelievers as those who, for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. And three times in Jesus' own ministry, he himself says that unbelievers will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have this, what to us would be kind of a contradiction. If hell is a place of fire, surely there would be light, and yet the Bible is teaching that hell is a place of utter darkness. How can both be true? Once again, we've seen that at least the fire probably is figurative, at least there's a, certainly a strong possibility that it is, describing the eternal dis disintegration of the personality of the unbeliever. But if the darkness mentioned is physical, that would be aw awful enough, wouldn't it? I mean, if you've ever been in a place of absolute utter darkness, which you, where you can't see your hand in front of your face, five minutes of that, and you begin to go stark raving mad, right? Think about doing that for an hour and a day and then a week and imagine how you would be by the end of that time. But the darkness, beloved of hell, almost certainly stands for more than that. It stands for moral darkness. It contrasts the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. Where, where, does, where does light come from? Who is the light of the world? John tells us in John 1, 9, right? Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is. Jesus is the one who shines light on the darkness. Jesus is the one who brings life in the place of death. Jesus is the one in whom light resides. So what is darkness? It is the complete absence of Jesus. Darkness is, at the end of the day, the complete and total separation from God that awaits those who reject him. You know, at, at night, occasionally, I have to go down to an office that's in my basement. And uh, typically, for one reason or another, I, I, stupidity maybe, I don't know, but I don't, I don't always turn on the lights. And so I go down there, and as I walk through the family room to the office, I hold my hands out in front of me. I do that because I've learned from hard experience that I get bent glasses, dents in my forehead, and other things if I don't, because the door may be open and it may be closed, who knows. 
you can hurt yourself. Why? Because in the darkness, beloved, you don't know what's real and what's not. You don't. You don't know truth. It's there, but you can't see it. You're separated from reality. And so you do what you can to try and protect yourself. That's what the kingdom of Satan, that's why, that's why the kingdom of Satan is consistently called the kingdom of darkness in the Bible. Why? Because there's no truth there because there's no God there. There's no reality there because there's no God there. To be in moral darkness is to be separated from reality. Unbelievers are constantly said to be dwelling in darkness. They are said to be, to have their eyes blinded. What does that mean? It means they're not seeing reality. They're not seeing life as it really is. They're not seeing life as it, from God's perspective, really exists. However smart they may be in worldly terms, and some of them are brilliant beyond any of us sitting in this room, their mind is still darkened to the realities of existence. John says in 1 John 1, 5, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. That's where light is. John 1, 4, in him was life and the life was the light of men. Colossians 1, 15, he has delivered us, that is believers, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's wonderful to be in the light instead of in the dark. But there's a problem. The problem is a lot of people don't want to be in the light. They don't want the light. Jesus knows that. Jesus also knew why. He said in John 3 verse 19, this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. That's, I mean, that is scary statements, isn't it? They love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. What's the problem? The problem is per people prefer their sin to the light of God. You can have it, beloved. You can have it that way in this life, but boy, when you see what it's like in the next life, you'll wish differently. When it's utter darkness, there's a choice now. There's no choice there. Hell is merely an extension of this preference for moral darkness that we have lived in or chosen in this life. It's an everlasting denial of spiritual reality. Darkness without dawn. You can see that darkness in the life, in the, in the existence of this man, even in hell. It's there. He's in denial of reality, even in the responses that Jesus gives him. He's there helpless in hell, yet he's lost touch with reality. Reality is that he's in a world of hurt and that Lazarus is in glory. And yet the rich man doesn't understand that reversal of roles. He's still looking at Lazarus as his servant. Sin Lazarus. The guy that he wouldn't even give dog food to that sat at his doorstep all those years, he wants now to serve him. He's out of touch with reality. He doesn't understand what's happened because he's still in darkness. Sin Lazarus. To cool my tongue. He's operating in utter, this is what it's like to operate in utter darkness. Reality is that he is outside the presence of God. But does he ask for God? No, he doesn't want God's presence anymore in that life than he did in this life. The lights are out. He's operating in total darkness, hopelessly lost, groping around, trying to find help, find, trying to find some solution, some temporary solution to a permanent problem. But there's no relief, there's no hope, there's no escape. To be in hell is to be forever seeking relief and never being able to find it. Trying to seek relief from the regret, from the bitterness, from the awfulness of the torment that's going on, from the suffering and never finding any help, not at all, because in hell there is no God, 
There is no Jesus, there is no salvation, and there is no hope. The lights are out permanently. Better get them turned on now, right? The party's over, but the payment has just begun. <clears throat> now next week we'll conclude this look at eternity without God. <laughs> Please come back. I don't want to do it any more than you do, but we need to know what Jesus teaches us, right? Why did Jesus tell this parable? Let's talk about hope for a minute, right? Why did he tell this parable? Because he wanted to bury people? No, because he wanted to do the opposite. You know, people say, well, you just want to scare me into heaven. Right! <laughs> That's right! I don't see Jesus doing any differently, do you? He's just telling the truth. He's just telling the truth and praying that somebody out there will respond to that message. Jesus told the parable in the hope that people would seek the light now while they have a chance. Psalm 1 Psalm 11, verse 28, David says, For it is you who light my lamp. The Lord, my God, lightens my darkness. Paul says something similar. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We need never experience the outer darkness of hell, but beloved, we've got to come to the light now. Because the me we choose now is the me we will be forever. Right? David Hume, some of you have read philosophy, have certainly run into him. Maybe you ran into him in your philosophy 101 class and wish you didn't, right? And you'd probably forgotten about him long ago. But David Hume was the ultimate skeptic. He was a naturalist who believed that what we see is all that exists. British humanist Kathleen Knott says that Hume, quote, hung his nose as far over the nihilistic abyss as anyone ever has. In other words, he looked at the conclusions of his, of his philosophy that there is nothing beyond this life, and he came to despair because of it. His identity was self. He said this, he said, I am a frightened and confounded with that forlorn solitude in which I am placed by my philosophy. Can you see the darkness descending already in this life? Choosing the identity of self, seeing that even here there's no light. He was alone, no Christ. He still had a chance, but he turned it down apparently. The nurse who attended him at his death said, you know, he would, when his friends were in, he would be cheerful, sometimes even frivolous. But she said, the moment the friends left, Here's what he said. He said, I have been in search of light all my life, but I am now in a greater darkness than ever. Darkness had become his identity, and believe me, if he didn't turn, darkness became his destiny. That's why Jesus is telling this parable. He doesn't want it to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way, but we have to find our hope in him. We have to find the light now. What time does Jesus get here? when you ask him to. But you have to mean it. And from the bottom of your heart, confess your sins, give yourself to him. Let's pray. Father, it's a hard message, but it's your message. I'm just trying to represent it as best we can. And so Father, I pray that somehow you will cause us to sink into our hearts. Those who are here with you, Lord, I pray that you'll give them assurance I pray that the light of your presence will light up their life even as they leave the door today. For those who know you not, for those who are unsure, don't let them spend another day not knowing. Don't let them spend another moment without confessing their sin to you, without coming to you in faith and saying, I, I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again for me. I, I accept the salvation you offer. I want to live for you. I want you to be on the throne of my life, not me. I'm praying for that right now, Father, that you will open hearts to you and that you will give the courage.
for them to come and talk to us and say, I need to know more. Can you help me understand this life that I have in Christ? Pray that you will do your heart work, Father, that we cannot do. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.